There we are. So last but certainly not least, uh, Dimitri. Um, I think it's very exciting uh, to, to talk about Big Cheney B because we're always looking for these you know, tangible examples of what can blockchain do. So on a lot of talks you will see by, uh, by people you hear, Everledger, Scribe, and um, these are uh, real tangible uh, blockchain solutions that are actually being used at the moment, uh, either to register uh, diamonds or register um, uh, ownership of uh, digital art. And these concepts started in the same company as uh, Big Chain DB. Uh, so certainly something goes right over there. Uh, Dimitri, tell us more. Thank you. Is it possible to have a... Oh. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi, Dutch hackers. Um, my name is Dimitri, um, BigChainDB, it's a Berlin-based company. It used to be called Ascribe, but uh, we found a, a better use case for our technology, so we renamed it uh, BigChainDB. And I'm looking at this screen, but it's another presentation, so I kind of have to... Ah, this slide. Um, so, I, I think most of the things have been said already, so it's going to be difficult for me to supplement you with new information, because you seem to be a very smart crowd. But um, I, I do want to take a little bit more distance and, and talk about what are your assets, your claims, the things of value um, that you have. And this could be almost anything you think of your property, anything of your financial stuff. Maybe it's your creative work. And how do people recognize that it's your value? Well, because we go to notaries, institutions, all these things. And these notaries and institutions, they're government-based, they act as a middleman, and they give credibility and reputation to your assets. They keep the ledgers, should be a ledger. Um, and, and they're basically the wheels of our economy at this point in time. And it's really trust, it's a trust issue. It's because they, take away the uncertainty that we have as people. Uh, they do our bookkeeping and they're uh, basically being watched by democracy, as far as that, that goes. Um, what, what you'll notice is that it, it's, it's also very applicable to, uh, for example, supply chain stuff. If you, if you buy a piece of chocolate, are you paying the farmer or are you, are you paying the middleman? Same goes for music. Are you paying the artist or are you paying the label? So there's kind of an imbalance and inequality there. And well, a few more examples. But what really is, is the key is you think you own stuff, but actually your data, your identity, your digital signature is on somebody else's servers. You don't own anything, actually. So the question is, can we take control? And, and Bitcoin kind of proved that to us, that there is a way for people to gain control, to have another kind of trust besides institutions. And Rutger can explain this way better than I can, so I'll do a little shot. Uh, how, I, how you could say is instead of trust by institutions, you could say it's trust by witnessing. If I have something quite useless in my pockets, but oh yeah, here a piece of paper. I could give this to you. Uh, you could say you could discard it, or you can keep, pass it on or keep it, whatever. It doesn't really matter at this point in time. But if I, I say if you return this back to me, I'll give you a beer. <laughs> you, you'll keep it, eh? and everybody here is witnessing this act. So at this point in time, that piece of paper kind of has value now. And that's trust by witnessing. In this group, we agreed that that achieved value. So, <laughs> I, uh, you get to, I owe you a beer, okay. Um, so we go from this trusted third parties, intermediaries, to peer-to-peer -peer trust, trust by witnessing. A lot of eyes looking at the same thing. You could also say like the simple version is it's a spreadsheet in the sky, nobody really owns it. Um, if you follow the rules to the system, then you can add something, you can change the state of it. But 
the rules are actually, and that's really important, they're an integral part. The policy, the, the, the government is inside of the system. It's very interesting. So, in the end, it ends up like etching something into stone, and this allows us to do valuable stuff. In order to explain Big Chain DB a little bit better, uh, I'll have to, uh, well, I have to say there are shades of trust. You have trust by witnessing, but if you're highly reputated witnesses, then it's different than if I'm an anonymous hacker that can join the network and be a validator of the node. There are different constraints in both of them. There are open systems, permission systems, all these things. And we lean more towards the permission systems, if you want to. But that doesn't mean that you don't own your data. It means that you still have the same shared source of truth. You still have the same rules that apply, but the validation is done by, by external parties, albeit anonymous or non-anonymous. Uh, allows us to create uh, internet of value. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so, if we want to do this uh, in, a, in a global scale fashion, we'll have to see what's the current state of our development process. And I think these slides might be interesting for you guys. So let's look at the status quo and look how uh, blockchain kind of changes how we think about uh, web development, ap application development, and legacy development. So this is a typical stack. I think many of you kind of recognize what this kind of is. You have your application on top. Um, could be any, any cool, your own application thing, typically written in the browser and consuming an API. Uh, you also have a platform, that's then more the back end. Uh, you have stuff like Heroku, I think Google App Engine and stuff like that. They, they allow you, they're an easy way for you to, to configure the back end of your system. Underneath, you have the business logic, the processing the computational effort. And then you have files, file systems, and you have a database. This database allows you to query data. And in parallel, you have some connecting protocols. Now, Bitcoin entered in 2008, and is it a, is it a database? Is Bitcoin a database? Well, I tried this with Ascribe, uh, our first version of BigchainDB, and I had a really hard time to actually use Bitcoin as a real database. We didn't want to use it as a coin. We wanted to color the coin into something that we could associate with digital arts, with copyrights and stuff like that. So I had to make sure that on a transaction, I could append information that points to that digital file, and then I had to be able to query all these transactions. And that's such a pain in the ass. And then I decided, well, Bitcoin isn't really built for... In my regard, Bitcoin isn't a database. It's a vault, it's an e-safe. It's something where you put your e-value, your, your e-gold, your e-money. Okay, Bitcoin initiated this. And then a lot of players came into the game. We saw some awesome examples today already from, from uh, IBM and, and, and Microsoft. And these guys are really on top of their game. And what I... I adjusted this slide with companies that we know and really are really good friends with. And they kind of do the same thing as you did before, but they do it in a decentralized way. So, shared share trust, peer-to-peer -peer trust. And at the top you have stuff like Eric's, Monax, roll your own blockchain. And today I should really add uh, Hyperledger or the, the IBM thingy there because it was amazing to see. Um, below that, I think it's processing. Decentralized processing, having the same computers executing that code. And definitely that's Ethereum, definitely that's Hyperledger. You'll see a few more, Cora, Lisk. Uh, these, these days they also store the entire state of things. So they, they kind of try to do both, but actually, they should pick where they're good at. That's my opinion. Me as a user, I want to choose which backends and, and bits and pieces I want to connect together. File systems, IPFS, Swarm, amazing stuff. It's really IPFS, the interplanetary file system, uh, kind of similar. 
not similar, but conceptually similar as what we saw from the U University of Delft. But still there is, you see this little gap? What's, what's there? What's your database? Where are you storing your data that you can query really, really well? Well, you could use Hyperledger a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's optimized for that. I think Hyperledger is more optimized for the processing part. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or, um, but yeah, that's where we try to fill in big chain DB. We take big, big data databases and we blockchainify them. Blockchain is not a noun for us. It's, a, it, 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 it's an adjective. You can blockchainify something that already exists. Um, I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit later and, and just to give you a feel how that works. We have a public instance coming up, IPDB, uh, Interplanetary Database, or inter Intellectual Property Database, you could choose. Um, some specs, if you, if, if you would use Bitcoin as a database back in the days, uh, it was kind of poor performance as a database. You had three transactions a second, 70 gigabytes total, uh, kind of pain in the ass. No query language. Um, what about if, what if you really want to do this well? What if you want to make sure that all the cultural commons, all the creative work can be globalized? How can we make this planetary scale? So uh, it made us think, because it's a noble, it's a noble vision, I think. Um, and we figured, well, Netflix tends to like, consume a lot of bandwidth, uh, a lot of throughput there. And what do they do? Well, they use these scalable databases. Adding more nodes to the system allows more throughput or more storage capacity. And it's flexible. If you have more demand, you just add more nodes, but it scales up. Bitcoin, adding more nodes, meaning adding more security, purely security. So the stronger the Bitcoin network, now it's about 4,000, 5,000 nodes, the stronger the security, the more difficult for you to hack the system. Now you have to consume more energy than the entire Ireland state in order to hack the system, more or less. So kind of expensive security. And going back to the trust issue, if you go for some, if you mean, if you change the constraints a little bit, not allowing anonymous participation of validation, but knowing a little bit what's inside of your federation, you can you can relax the constraints a bit, and then you can start using scaling. Um, another important thing is uh, queryability. In order to look something up into a CSV file, is quite costly. Better optimized queries, and they are applied to databases. You'll also see sharding, and that's kind of distributing the information amongst the nodes. So that's how big data databases kind of work. Now, how do you blockchainify them? Well, you take this, tr well, we, we identified three main characteristics of a blockchain. As an end user, you, you'll see there is shared control. It's decentralized. Nobody really owns it. And that we can do by, by isolating. If you take a big data database, then it's distributed. One person contains all the nodes of the distribute. Netflix owns every node of its system. But there are ways to make sure that the nodes are owned by different people. So we apply techniques there. Immutability, making sure nobody can erase things. Write once, delete never. Append only those things. And that you can enforce with cryptography, hashing of change, and stuff like that. So we force the data structure to be what we call a directed acyclic graph, or a blockchain, or a chain of hashes, or stuff like that. Uh, that makes sure you have immutability. Native assets, and that's more cryptography there, and that's basically everybody that signs off on a transaction has to provide a signature. That signature is computed by a private key. That private key is your identity at this point in time. So. How it actually works is, well, we have a federation. We t take, does this work? Okay, I'll, I'll have to point. We'll take an existing database. Currently, we have two partners, MongoDB and ReadingDB. Uh, unfortunately, ReadingDB went purely to the community lately, so Mong MongoDB is our main effort now. And we use their consensus layer, and that consensus layer does something really important. It's ordering events at such a pace 
it's incredible. And the consensus layer of, of MongoDB and ReadingDB, they make sure that all the nodes at the same time see the same version of the data at very high scales. And we wrap a, another consensus layer on top of it, which enforces the immutability, shared control, and the assets. Uh, we don't allow, f like, it, it, we work with transactions. Those transactions are locked by some, some cryptographic primitives. They're not like fully fledged smart contracts where you can have a vault with any kind of code to crack to open it. No, it's, it's a bit less, we, we call it crypto conditions. It's more if then else, multi-sig tree, stuff like that. It's quite basic, it doesn't, it's not Turing complete, but it's quite secure and fast. So in a nutshell, I think um, what we try to do is merge best of tr both worlds under specific constraints of federation and stuff like that. Um, that's that. We have a few, we, we, we sometimes hear from people, oh, look, we made this um, with, you, with you. So Resonate is doing IP, IP music rights. They uh, do copyright stuff and streaming services. Um, Ascribe, um, it's really trying to have treat digital art the same as you use physical art, limited edition, stuff like that, consignees. Um, authentic, vi visual identity, it's making sure that you own your digital identity and you choose who you give piece, bits and pieces or, or proofs of your identity. Um, ben Ben, really nice. Uh, they're uh, a company going to Ghana to poor people that, don't, that exploit land and everybody in their community knows they own the land, but the government won't recognize that. If the government doesn't recognize that you own land, then you cannot uh, get a loan because you don't have something to back it up. You don't have any mortgage. And so they go there and try to fix it with GPS coordinates and, and external uh, people vouching for this, giving them a, an easy to access digital system to, to actually open up this friction. Recruit, it's all about, it's kind of the decentralized LinkedIn, uh, making sure that HR people can actually verify that you did receive that certificate and not from online, uh, high school, whatever, dot com. Uh, RWE, they, it's a German regulator of, of, of energy. They feel existential threat. I mean, energy is deregulating, so why do you need a regulator there? So RWE, they, they recognize this and they want to be a player. They want to embrace their existential threat. Uh, so basically, it's all about getting solar coins, wind coins and stuff on, uh, out there, having your IoT devices communicate with, with transactional ledgers, buying and selling at the, at the right points in time. Tangent 90 is a uh, supply chain of health, making sure that if you, uh, if you buy a syringe, it, it went through the right process. We have the same for Everledger diamonds, making sure that they're not blood diamonds and that they follow all the process, having transparency in the process there. And for the diamonds, interestingly, the value is in the insurer, in the insuree or the insurer who actually knows how to appreciate the diamond, the value of the diamond. So, and here is where you guys jump in. Uh, I, I made a really poor sketch, but kind of gives you an idea of how we think it goes. I, I put down a few verticals. Uh, intellectual property, identity, finance, energy, supply chain, government. Some uh, of the aspects of blockchain, like the re real key characteristics, I filled in a few of them. And there are still open gaps, there are still a few blue oceans. You really can make, if you want, you guys together can make something like a direct de democracy or something like that. I mean, it's, it's that easy with the decentralized stuff we have around. So why, why don't you fill in one of those gaps and just, we have a blank app store and you guys can just start building on top of that. So that's cool. Uh, IPDB, I think, I hope we'll get this ready for your hackathon, we'll be there. And this would be then the public instance, like you have the Ethereum net and the Ethereum code, you have BigchainDB running, uh, IPDB running on top of BigchainDB. It's for everyone, everywhere, kind of uh, store your comments, your creative stuff. Um, I, 
we do work in federated mode because we have we cannot not just allow the same security constraints as Bitcoin or Ethereum are doing with their public networks, but we try to be smart about it. We, when we choose a federation, we choose uh, people that care about the future of the internet. We have, for example, Internet Archive. Uh, Unmonastery, very interesting because unmonast monasteries are actually the oldest institutions still alive, and we forecast that they will be alive as long as Catholicism doesn't die. Um, so, but they 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 are entering the digital age, so they'll have these rusty old servers still running on old IPDB. You know, would be cool. Then we have uh, companies. These are non-profits. We have a few companies like ourselves, BitchingDB, but Consensus, which is a spin-off of Ethereum. Uh, we have IPFS, Eris. Like really, a lot of the ecosystem people that are just participating on this. So yeah, I think. Oh yeah, I'm I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, perfectly in time, uh, Dimitri. Thank uh, you. Th thank you so much. Uh, yeah. It's not easy being between uh, us and the drinks. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, um, all these examples you mentioned, are they uh, separate startups? Uh, and and are they working on a separate uh, big chain DB instance, or is it in a commonly shared ledger? Um, we have startups popping up. But we also have uh, companies that have uh, almost 10 to 20,000 employees using Big Chain DB, for example, Recruit, which is the biggest in Japanese. We have teleconsultants. So we have really built companies using our technology, but they don't only use our technology. I mean, that stack I showed you before, it's really important to keep in mind. Keep your, uh, don't choose one product. Shop around a bit. Do things uh, in, in parallel. So. We're not a spin-off creator. Uh, we're a spin-off facilitator. Mm -hmm. What was the other question? I well, the, uh, do they share ledgers oh, yeah. or are they each separate? Well, the for, for the Everledger case, it's kind of take all the diamond mines, all the diamond certification labs, cutting labs, and even uh, insurers, like create your ecosystem. But that's one of the first questions you should ask yourself creating a decentralized application is, what's my ecosystem? Uh, who do who do I want to work with, but I really don't trust them. That's kind of, and, 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 and maybe but, even if you trust them right now, you, you can keep yeah. trusting them. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but it can also be in, inside of a big co corporation, eh? like uh, going from plant A to plant B and you have to sign off on stuff and, and just have transparency. That's also really important, just okay. transparency. Okay. Yeah. So any questions from the audience? Can we have the cube? Question for you. Um, so, when would you consider maybe not to use Big Chain DB, but to use uh, like another type of a blockchain, maybe more the classic one that we we, we heard about uh, today? That's a really good question, and I would say if you have really your e gold and e value, like really things that are you can hurt in your wallet. Um, uh, use something that's more secure as us, because there are grades of decentralization. And, and then I would really go to like the high security solution, like you have in Bitcoin and Ethereum. They kind of they kind of nail down their consensus algorithms there. Um, if you store files, we have we have this question also: Can I store files in your database? Don't store files in a database. <laughs> <laughs> True. So do you do you also see? Um, do you also see a use case for using BigChain to be in combination with, for example, uh, <coughs> other blockchains? Perfect, perfect question. So yeah, and there you have, well, there, there's so many things there. Um, I think any healthy application stack should contain a database to just uh, query stuff find stuff, interrogate your data, do machine learning stuff on top of it, maybe uh, just all the big data uh, aspects of it. Uh, but And I, we see it in conjunction. For example, you can create a smart contract in Ethereum. Like, for example, there is this company, Uport, and 
they're doing visual identity management. So you have three smart contracts. One of them is, what if I lose my key? The other one is, I'm a proxy to my key. And the other one is a registry of all your data. But they don't store the data inside of smart contract. Typically, they store pointers to IPFS or IPDB or something like that. And then you, you give a, the bits and pieces of information you give away are managed by the smart contracts and it results into a link on IPFS or IPDB. So, yeah, kind of orchestration layer and, and data storage. Thank you. Here's another question. Where? Oh, nice. Uh, how would you communicate uh, with uh, BigchainDB from, for example, uh, from Ethereum through, uh, through Solidity? Do you have special uh, software libraries for that? So uh, it's a funny question because uh, I'm chairing this com community group. It's called Interledger. And Interledger is a protocol and it's kind of the, what IP is for the Internet of Information. Interledger is for the Internet of Value. So it's a protocol to communicate messages between uh, between clusters of servers. And it's a very good question. Like, blockchain is all about um, decentralization, but we're creating silos of blockchains, and they can't communicate with each other. So, and that specification of Interledger, which we use natively, can be used to communicate with BigchainDB. You just have to, have to wrap a message in Ethereum to, to do so. But the, the difficult thing about Ethereum is that it's, the EVM is a closed, closed thing. During ex execution, nobody can go out. So you'll need services that push data into your smart contract. And that's what Oracleize is doing. That's making an Oracle. Uh, you can have some pr cryptographic proofs of authenticity there. But yeah, the nature for, of the game. For us, yeah, we, we're building on, uh, on Ares. Yeah, is it yeah, working? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it wasn't working just. Yeah, we were writing some smart contracts in uh, in Ares, a social insurance system, and one of our problems was that we we store everything in in Ares in, in separate database contracts just to make release management possible. Because when you want to migrate your logic, you have to upload it to a new uh, contract, a new new public key, and then you lose your data. So this yeah. would be a good solution if we could use Bigchain DB as a storage for our data. But then we when you, when you migrate from one smart contract to the other, you should be able to set the authorizations on, on BigchainDB so that only the new contract can talk to that BigchainDB. Yeah. And actually, I'm, I'm very upfront with Ares is also in, in Berlin, Monax now. And, and we're really putting things together there. So you'll see something popping out from Monax that it's communicating with BigchainDB soon. So there is yeah. process, uh, progress there. And yeah, really looking forward to some sign of kind of release management solution. That's now we have to come up with it all, all by ourselves, but so, so some ready-made release management uh, stuff for, uh, for for blockchain. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my final question would be: uh, if teams want to use BigChainDB, they can just uh, get a, to the website and install it, or how so do they add it to their stack, basically? Uh, it's not as fancy as with the uh, IBM Hyperledger thing. I was really impressed <laughs> by that. <laughs> but yeah, they solve a different problem. I, I'll assure me. <laughs> um, so IPDB, I'll get it up and running for the hackathon. Uh, so then it's just an API call. Uh, also, we're open source, and we really m made the friction of s uh, spinning up an IPDB federation on your local system should be super easy. Um, if you have dependencies installed. It's open source, GitHub, even just, you can start contributing and, and, and get some really cool stickers or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> We're giving away some loot. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so, and, and we'll be around. I, I'll, I'll take a team of one or two. And ik zal ze Nederlands leren. Good. All right. Dimitri, thank you.